Welcome back to Music 239, Intro to World Music. We will be finishing our unit on India at this time with a discussion of a composition by a contemporary American composer named David Amram, who was here on campus during the spring of 2007. Some of you may have met him during that time. Uh, and David uh, got to talking, as he has a tendency to do, about uh, the composition that he had written involving Indian raga and tala that I thought I would show you as part of the presentation on this chapter. The interesting thing about raga and tala is that in combination with each other, they have a very interesting comparison to be made to medieval music that many of you may have learned about in your music history classes. In music history, you may have learned about something in the 13th century called an isorhythmic motet. And the isorhythmic motet uh, was made up of melodic fragments called color and rhythmic fragments called talia, which were put together to create patterns. Now, if you look at Indian music, you have the raga and the tala. The talia of the isorhythmic motet corresponds to the tala of the Indian music, and I think that there is a common root word there that uh, came down in both cultures. It's a very interesting combination of cultures that we see in those linguistic kinds of things. This is not information for the test, but uh, just an aside, particularly for the music majors in the class that uh, might have taken a music history class uh, prior to this time. So we saw from the Beatles example and from Pieces of East that Indian music is probably one of the most influential cultures on the music of the West, and particularly on the popular music of the West in the last 40 years. Uh, what it's also fair to point out is that music of other cultures has an effect on the classical music of the West. I have a composition entitled Chakra by David Amram in which we will see how the raga and the tala are used to create a classical piece of music. This is a piece that he wrote about 10 years ago for orchestra, and the raga that is being used is the Bhopali raga, and you can see it on your PowerPoint there. It doesn't have all of the tones that the ragas that we've studied so far have. In fact, it's only a five-note raga, and the notes that are there are the same five notes that you saw in the pentatonic scale back at the beginning of this course when we talked about Native American, African music, African American music. That same pentatonic scale is available to Indian music as well. It's just that it's not the only scale. It's not the only raga that is available. In this case, uh, however, David Amram chose that particular raga because he wanted to write a very pentatonic sounding piece in this particular part of the piece. So he uses that raga and then he combines it with the Japtal Tala. And we're gonna practice that here in a minute because the X's on the PowerPoint show where the division of the pulses are. So where the accents in this particular tala occur. Let's try it, shall we? Here we go. In, in 10 beats. Ready? One, two, three, four. Two, five, seven, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. Okay. Then he writes his melody based on the raga, and when you hear the orchestral version, there's a wood block that is playing those accents from the Japtal Tala that we just heard. And uh, the raga in the melody in the oboe that you're going to hear comes uh, about 
midway through this movement, and the little tune there has been transposed to G. So if you took the raga in C that I played before, and you transposed it to G, you would have And that's what you're going to hear the oboe play. And then the woodblocks are playing the accents that we just clapped from the Japtal Tala. Let's listen to how this comes together in this David Amram composition. Here's the oboe. Here's the accents. This music doesn't sound Indian at all. I mean, there, there are very few Indian elements here, but what he has done is to take the constructing devices of the raga and the tala and to put them together in an orchestral texture to use it as uh, a building block for a piece that basically doesn't really sound like it's from India when you, uh, when you hear it, at least not the section that we just heard. So uh, uh, once again, the, the, that kind of cross-cultural thing is the, the element that we're going to be studying more and more in the course in terms of how cultures have combined to create interesting kinds of effects. That's really what a lot of the history of music is all about, is how cultures combine to create something that wasn't there in the first place. Thus, African American music, for example, uh, which combined multicultures uh, beginning in about the 16th century and then resulted in all of the various manifestations that we studied when we studied African American music. None of that happened before the 16th century, so cross-cultural kinds of combinations of music are part of what makes music history so interesting. To conclude our unit on India, I would like you to watch a very special performance by a guest performer named Vikas Gupta from India, who is a virtuoso sitar player. He is accompanied by a tabla player who actually comes from Illinois and uh, was gracious enough to drive to Springfield to assist Vikas in this performance. His name is Manivanan Bedi. Please enjoy their performance.
let's talk about the test. Okay, so the test will be set up in the same format as what we had on the first test, in that the first five, the first section will consist of five listening examples. And once again, you need to know the title. In this case, uh, I've, I've, I don't have a list of pieces that are on the test because basically everything from these chapters that is on your CD is fair game on the test. Okay? The good news is that they'll all be played from the beginning. So I'm not going to go to the middle of Sarasaruha and drop the needle. That's, that's the good news. Yeah, I do want you to be able to tell me the instrumentation, uh, the importance of the music to this culture, and then also identify at least two characteristics of this music that are characteristics of that particular culture. Okay, uh, so the listening is set up that way, the same as it was the last time, and, and remember to tell me something about the culture. Some of you didn't do that the last time, you just put the title, didn't tell me the importance of this music in the culture. The, 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 the advantage you have this time is you don't have individual African tribes that you have to memorize in terms of where it comes from to identify the, the instruments. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I can't spell mandrungum. Mandrungum. If you write drum, I will probably accept that just fine. Okay. okay? If you can't remember how to spell mandrungum. What about the string instruments? Stringed instruments, um, such as uh, in in Japan, for example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. If you want to put, uh, yeah, drone would be fine. Shruti would be nice. Vena is not too difficult to, to, to remember. Let's start from the, let's go back and review starting a little more methodically looking at uh, African American music again. So go back to your notes on African American music. After the listening portion of the test there will be multiple choice again. There will be some additional matching. Uh, you might look at that um, in the African American section, you might look at that diagram on the blues and see if you could reproduce that if you had to. That might be a good thing to know for an essay, to be able to reproduce the diagram that's on the PowerPoint on the blues. Try to remember that. What's the difference between a work song and a field holler? Okay, so the, the reason that's improvised is because there's only one singer and they don't have to stay together with anybody, right? Okay, Eric, did you have a... Like I said, they usually to communicate Yes, in some cases the field hollers were used to communicate information to different uh, people across the field. Um, what African American characteristics can you find in both of these songs, work songs and field hollers? Hmm? Blue notes, okay. Certainly blue notes, what else? Go back to your characteristics and, uh, and look at those and see what those might be. Blue notes, certainly. What about the blues scale? Certainly might find that in both of these, right? Motor rhythm, we talked about that existing in the work song but not in the field holler. Syncopation. Swing, swing eighths, possibly. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so all of these elements uh, might find themselves into these songs, with the possible exception of motor rhythm, which is only going to be in the work song. Um, okay, what about? Um, the blues. Okay. What's the basic structure of the blues? Okay. That, the, the, the three line 12 bar blues 
is definitely one of the possibilities. What's the other structure that we studied? The quatrain refrain stop time. Okay, that's the other structure. And in the 12 bar three line structure, uh, what, is the, what is the basic format? How does the music proceed? One, four, five. There's use of the one and four and five chords. How, how is that structured? Okay, we start with one. It's like two parts. Okay. One, one, and then four, one, and five, one. Okay. And it's called like voice fill, voice fill, voice fill. Ah, yes. Okay, so we're going to have two bars of, of one with a voice, and then we're going to have two bars of one with a fill, right? So that's the first four bars. Then the second four bar segment, which is the second line, is going to do what? It's going to go to four, isn't it? So two bars of four, which is sung, followed by two bars of four, which is fill. Or, or, one. or, or going back to one. Yeah. Which does it do? What, is your, what does your chart tell you? One. Goes back to one, doesn't it? OK. So one, one, four, one. And these are two bar segments. And then the last four bars, what happens? OK. There's a couple different variants there. Could go a measure of five, and then a measure of four, and then two measures of one. Or it could do two measures of five, and then, just, and then two measures of one. There's, there's, a, there's a variety of different variants there. And when you get into it, uh, variations occur all over the place in that particular area. But uh, yeah, the basic design is set up like that. As long as yeah. you do one of the correct ones, that's okay. As long as you do one of the correct ones, if that's one of the variants that's, uh, that, that happens, I'll certainly accept that, yeah. Okay, so be able to construct that from, from, uh, from scratch without having to, to look at it, okay? That would be a good thing to know. Um, what about the uh, uh, quatrain refrain format? How does that differ? Yeah, it's set up more like a verse chorus, okay? And then, and in the, in the traditional format, how many verses would there be? Four. There'd be four verses, wouldn't there, in the traditional quatrain refrain? Although, as we've seen in pop songs, they tend to get longer than just a quatrain, don't they? Right? Anybody name? Can anybody name any of the pop songs that we studied that had quatrain refrain? She got me walking. Well, that that one is in your uh, in your CD. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, but we studied we studied an early rock and roll piece that. Uh, Maybelline did that. Uh huh. What else? There was another Chuck Berry song. That car song. The car song. Called. You can't catch me, is what it's called. Yeah, both "You Can't Catch Me" and Maybelline were early Chuck Berry songs that used the quatrain refrain format. So that format is structured more like verse chorus, where there are the four verses of the quatrain, and then you go into the refrain, which is part of the three line 12 bar blues. But usually just the second two lines. They don't do the first line usually and as the refrain for the quatrain refrain format. Anybody notice that? Okay. When you do the quatrain refrain, you have the quatrain the four verses, and then the refrain part of it is usually the second two lines of the three-line blues format. They don't repeat that first line usually in the refrain of the, of, of the quatrain refrain. Okay, so then just knowing all of the examples that are on the CD, will be very helpful in uh, making sure that you've got the blues down. What about Dr. Payne's presentation on spirituals? What do you remember from that? Hidden messages in a lot of the songs. 
Yeah, they were coded, weren't they? Okay, so uh, can you name some of the coded songs that he discussed? Follow the Drinking Gourd. What else? Wait in the Water. What else? Gospel Train. Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Okay, these are all examples of coded songs. Uh, another good example of that I think he gave is Steal Away. What does steal away mean? It's going to be a secret meeting, and when the storm comes, listen for the thunder, and under the cover of the thunder, head toward the secret meeting place where we will be discussing who gets to escape next, or whatever. Okay. And then India, which we just finished. What is a palimpsest? It's a parchment, right, on which you can write over and over again. And the Prime Minister Nehru of India uh, likened India to a parchment because the new and the old were all mixed together. And we've seen that principle in many of the uh, cultures in Asia that we've studied, including India and China. What's the Melakarta system? Melakarta system, what is that? That's the actual name of the system in which ragas and talas are used to create the melodies and the rhythms of the music. Melakarta system. And what's a raga? A raga is a scale form. It is a set of pitches. What's well, a tala? Uh, yeah, it is, it is a set of rhythmic <coughs> accents, right, in some sort of repeated pattern so <coughs> that the pattern keeps repeating in that particular pattern. And we clapped a couple of them in class, including the, the one most recently uh, associated with the David Amram composition. Uh, it would be a good thing for you to spend some time reviewing the instruments that we studied in class from China, the Suona, the Hulus, the Sheng, the Baou, Diza, Pipa, Kujong, and uh, Arhu and the Tibetan singing bowl, and we talked about the religious uh, influences there. OK. Other questions? Everybody feel uh, they're ready to go for the test, or at least ready to start studying for the test? 